This happened last year on Hanukkah. Coming from a deeply rooted Jewish family, I can tell without a shadow of a doubt that tradition means a lot in our culture. My mother loves cooking and feeding everyone, and last year's Hanukkah happened to be special. It was my first Hanukkah after Bar Mitzvah. Hence, the celebration was at its peak. The dining table was filled with all the special dishes that we Jews love from the bottom of our hearts. There was sofken yod, a kind of donut with jelly filling inside, latkes, most commonly known as potato pancakes, and brisket, a large piece of beef slow cooked with all the special spices. There was wine, beer, bourbon, and a few words, too many foods, and too many drinks on the same table. Even though we had a small family, our joy and laughter made the house echo and merriment. My dad died when I was a toddler, and since then, my mom and my grandpa raised me with all their love. We sat down and raised a glass, cheering. Happy Hanukkah. Being a food lover, my grandfather started to eat a lot. Keeping in mind his old age, my mom told him to slow down on the brisket, but he was unstoppable that night. After a delicious dinner, we all bid goodnight to each other and went to bed. Around 1.30 in the morning, I got up feeling thirsty. I walked downstairs to the kitchen to get water from the jug. It was a moonlit night, and the pale rays of moonlight were coming from the kitchen window, making the area perfectly visible. Hence, I didn't feel the need to switch on the kitchen light. I stopped near the small table and poured myself a glass of water. As I took the first sip, my eyes went to the left side of the kitchen floor, and the glass fell from my hand, shattering into pieces. My grandpa was lying on the floor dead. His mouth was open, eyes were bulging out, and he was covered in his own vomit. My eyes were stuck in his terrifying wide eyes. I wanted to scream for help, but for a few seconds, I couldn't move a muscle. Mom, help! Hearing my cry for help, she rushed downstairs and switched on the kitchen light. We found out that this Hanukkah was Grandpa's last meal that eventually killed him. Due to excessive food, he suffered serious indigestion and died choking on his own vomit. His room was right beside the kitchen, so maybe he tried to come out and call for us, but fate didn't spare him any more time. My mom and I grieved for some hours, and then we realized we have to do the needful. The only relative of ours lives three hours away from our house. We called them, but due to a heavy night of celebration, we guessed everyone was dead asleep. My mom and I cleaned the vomit and placed him on his bed. She then sat me down and said, Isaac, I must drive to your uncle's house and bring them here. But we both can't leave your grandpa like this. We have to perform the vigil. Tonight, you must be the Shomer and chant the Telehem until I come back. Being a minor, there's no way I could drive and bring my uncle here, so I realized I have a serious responsibility tonight. Who would have thought a happy night of Hanukkah will turn into a vigil? For those who aren't aware of this ritual, let me tell you, it's our way of honoring the dead. When a Jew dies, a watch is kept over the body and Telehem is recited constantly until the burial service. Vigils extend from eventual death to burial, ritualistically to pray for a loved one, but more so their body is never left alone. The one who keeps watch over the dead is known as a Shomer, and he must stay awake the entire night and go on with his prayers. My mom wiped her tears and hugged me. She said, you can do this, don't be afraid. Grandpa loved you. The thought of being alone in the entire house with the dead body of my grandpa shook me from the core. I was just a 13 year old boy with no experience in this case whatsoever. So in the next five minutes, I stood at our house porch and watched my mom drive away with sobbing eyes. As I came inside and locked the door, I could hear the deep silence echoing around me. I have never felt this quiet in my entire life. A house where hours earlier, people laughed in joy, sunk in deep despair with sudden death. I sat down near my grandpa's bed and started to read prayers from the book of Psalms. Seeing my grandpa just lying there with his eyes closed made me feel extremely uncomfortable. Though I knew he is dead, I couldn't help but think maybe he will wake up soon and say this was all just a Hanukkah prank. But the truth hits harder than anything in this world. The big clock in our living room rang twice and I realized it's 2 a.m. It felt like the night was too long. I remembered how my mom told me to keep on praying and stay awake until she comes back, but being tired and alone, I don't remember when I dozed off.
I don't remember how long I was asleep, but suddenly I heard the sound of utensils rattle in the kitchen, which woke me up. I rubbed my eyes and was about to get back to the prayers when I noticed my grandpa's bed. For the last few hours, the body that was lying on this bed right in front of me wasn't there anymore. A cold shiver ran down my spine, and I slowly turned my head towards the door of this room leading to the kitchen. The sound of utensils was still coming from the kitchen. I yelled, Grandpa, is that you? But then my senses kicked in. How can it be him? He's dead. I got up trembling in fear and came out of the room. The long corridor stood in front of me, leading to the kitchen and the living room. There were drops of blood on the floor. My heartbeat got faster, and I felt something awful was waiting for me on the other side of the corridor. Somehow I managed to walk to the kitchen and saw my grandpa sitting on the floor, facing his back at me and eating something from the dustbin underneath the sink. For a moment, I thought maybe he is still alive. I mean, things like that do happen. Maybe his heart stopped for a while and now he's back with us just like before. Overwhelmed with joy and relief, I shouted, Grandpa, you're alive. Mom and I were so... But before I could finish, my grandpa turned his face toward me and what I saw will remain in my nightmares forever. His eyes were completely white with no pupils in them and his skin was bloodless, just like a dead body. His hands and his face were smeared with blood. He was holding a dead rat with his entrails pulled out. Some of his intestines were still hanging from the edge of his mouth. He swooped them in like hot noodles and said in a demonic voice, I'm hungry, and shoved the rest of the mouse inside his mouth and started chewing it like his favorite piece of brisket. I screamed and ran to my room, locking the door behind me. I crouched on the floor and started to pray in my sobbing voice. I wished my mom to come back as soon as possible. Whatever was eating that dead mouse can't be my grandpa, that's for sure. I knew it was my fault that I couldn't keep watch and fell asleep, but I never anticipated the situation to take this horrible turn. I prayed and prayed and probably fainted on the floor. I woke up two days later in the hospital. By then, my grandpa was already buried following our tradition and ritual. My mom and uncle visited me at the hospital and gave me the quite shocking news. When they returned home, they found grandpa lying on the bed. He had blood stains on his face and mouth, which didn't make any sense. Then they found my room locked and had to break in, thinking something bad has happened to me. As I lay on the hospital bed, terrified with the shock, I couldn't tell them what exactly happened that night. That was my first and last time being a showman. Every Hanukkah, this scary incident revisits me in my dreams, and I see my dead grandpa standing near my bed saying, I'm hungry. Hey guys, before starting the next story, I would like to suggest to you guys to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. And if you have already subscribed, then you guys are awesome. I looked at the clock while checking the brisket in the oven. It's 7.30 p.m. and Ruth should have been home by now. Ruth is my elder sister, who is the only family I have now. We were young when our parents died in a plane crash. Even though we come from a Jewish family, due to many lifestyle changes, we have failed to follow all our norms and traditions. But on the last day of Hanukkah, we cooked brisket for dinner and lit up candles to pay our respect in our small way. Ruth and I have made this pact that every year, no matter where we are, we will see each other on Hanukkah and celebrate it to spread a little joy in our life. I came yesterday to stay with her. Her cozy two-story house gave me a comforting vibe that I haven't gotten in a long time. We are going on a small trip tomorrow, and I am hoping to have a good time there. If I get lucky, I might meet some sensible guy. Thinking this and also feeling bored, I went to apply a face mask to rejuvenate my skin. I called Ruth, and as she picked up, I said, Hey, when will you be home? Sorry, Stacy, I'm trying. ASAP. You know how busy the office gets before the weekend. Just chill on your own. I will be home soon. Cool. Don't forget the wine. I won't. Gotta go. Bye. She hung up and I applied the mask on my face and played some music to relax a bit. The brisket will take in half an hour more to cook, so I had a lot of time on my hand. I was enjoying the mask and a little self-care. Fifteen minutes later, I heard the main door open and Ruth walk in. 
Due to the mask, I couldn't open my eyes, so I said in a cheerful voice, You're home early, she replied. Mm-hmm. What happened? Did the cat get your tongue? Nothing. You sound tired. Pour yourself a glass of wine. The brisket will take time. I heard Ruth walking towards the kitchen. While she made herself comfortable, I went on chatting like I always do. I talked about how Grandma used to make us our special dinner on Hanukkah, and we both finished our meal like good girls just to get the chocolates at the end of the meal. Childhood was a fun time. I was ranting like a chatterbox, but quite odd about my sister. She was being too quiet, and that was against her nature. I mean, she talked more than me. I didn't say anything for a while, thinking she is really tired. Her constant movement went around the house, and all of a sudden, my phone rang. Without taking the mask off, I said, Alexa, answer the call. My device was already linked to it, so the call buzzed, and I heard a familiar voice on the other side. Panina, sorry for running late. I just got off from work. I'm picking up the wine and will be home before you can say brisket. Love you, sis. I could feel my body freezing on that couch as my sister Ruth hung up on me. If she isn't home yet, then who have I been talking to for the last several minutes? <laughs> A creepy chuckle rang right next to my ear and I took the mask off in one go. A dirty, pale face was staring down at me. The eyes in that face were so disturbingly green that for a moment, it felt like a creature from another world. Not being able to move in fear, I just stared back like a statue. A horrifying looking strange woman was staring at me, standing in my own house whom I thought to be my sister. We stayed like that for a minute, which felt like a lifetime to me. Then she said in her rusty voice, how about I slit your throat before your sister comes home and hide your body in the closet? Then I will wait for her and do the same after she enters from that entrance. <laughs> what? What do you want? I just told you what I want. I slowly got up and slid back on the couch while trembling in fear. The woman didn't move, didn't do anything, just smiled big. I could see in her eyes how much she was enjoying my fear. I said in a fumbled voice, uh, Look, look, if you want money, there's my purse. Take all and just leave. You look really scared, but I haven't done anything yet. Panina, isn't that what your sister called you on the phone? If I scream right now, the neighbors will hear you and they will call the cops on you. So... It'll be better, but will you scream even after seeing this? The woman took out a big sharp knife, which she took from my kitchen. I got up while shaking and said, Why are you doing this? I just need a shelter for the night. Panina, it was tough to break from prison after committing three murders, you know? And now that I have a chance to a uh, free light, I can't risk it because of you and your sister. Come on, lay down here like you were lying before and let me slit your throat in the most painless way possible. In the beginning, you will feel a sharp pain and pressure of blood rushing out of your veins, but then it will all be over. I promise your sister won't feel a thing either. My head throbbed as I realized this woman is an escaped convict who entered our house finding the door unlocked. Suddenly, the oven alarm buzzed as the brisket was ready and the woman got distracted a little. Using that opportunity, I ran towards the kitchen to grab a weapon to defend myself. But before I could reach the top shelf, she grabbed my hair with full strength and bashed my head on the kitchen desk right beside the oven. I screamed in pain, hitting the hard surface and fell on the floor. The woman then lunged at me with the knife but I moved over and she stabbed the knife on the wooden floor. The knife cut through the floor and got stuck. As she tried to pull it out, I opened the oven door and grabbed the warm tray of brisket. My palms burnt like crazy, but I ignored the pain as I fought for my survival. I dropped the heavy metal tray right on her face and she screamed in pain. Half of her face got burnt with the hot surface of the tray. Without giving her a second chance to get up, 
I grabbed her hair and stuck her head right inside the hot oven and started to slam the oven lid on her. Once, twice, thrice, and that's it. Her shivering body became quiet when I hit her for the last time. Her brain matter and chunks of skin fell into the oven and she stopped moving forever. I fell on the floor, holding my bleeding head just when Ruth entered, opening the main door. She screamed seeing the bloody scene and I fainted on the floor. The next morning when I woke up in my room, I was surrounded by cops and a doctor. The cops told me how this woman escaped the local prison and barged into our house. I still thank God for giving me that presence of mind and strength to fight this crime. Only one of us could have survived that night, and luckily, it was me. If she managed to kill me, my sister would have been dead too. Like she said, I don't think I will ever be able to celebrate Hanukkah the same way again. Those disturbing green eyes have scarred me for life. My boyfriend was Jewish, and though I wasn't Jewish or even particularly religious myself, I loved learning about his culture and traditions. One December, he asked me to sleep over at his family's house during the eight days of Hanukkah. You don't have to stay for Hanukkah if you don't want to, but it'd be a great opportunity for you to get closer with my family and learn about our culture. I'd love to go, but there's just one problem. What is it? You remember that I live with my grandpa, right? I'd have been living with my grandfather and taking care of him for the past two years. Because of his age, he was barely strong enough to get around with the help of a walking stick. I don't think I can leave my grandpa alone at the house for eight whole days. He'll either trip on the stairs or burn the house down trying to cook while I'm gone. Oh, you can bring him over too if you'd like. Will that really be all right? Of course. I've been curious to meet this grandpa of yours for a while anyways. Later that day, I talked with my grandfather about staying over at my boyfriend's house for Hanukkah. He didn't seem to like the idea very much, but I was the one bringing home the bread and paying the bills, so he didn't have much room to argue. On the first day of Hanukkah, I arrived at the house with my grandfather and they all greeted us with open arms. There was my boyfriend, Jacob, his little brother, Noah, and his father and mother. While I caught up with my Jacob's parents, my grandfather sat on a sofa seat next to the fireplace with a grumpy frown on his face. Little Noah, being the energetic little kid he was, pestered the cranky old coot nonstop. My grandfather was probably the oldest person he'd ever met, so he kept asking him questions about what is it like being old and if he had any stories about his life. How do you live so long? Do you think you'll reach a hundred? What do you do for fun without any video games? How is life like without the internet? My grandfather would give short, often sarcastic answers to the young boy's questions, but never told him to stop asking them. Though he was still kind of crotchety, as the night went on, I'd sometimes catch the faintest hint of a smile on my grandfather's face as he chatted with Noah. He would never admit it, but I think my grandfather liked the special attention young Noah gave him. Soon after the sun had set, the family and I gathered around the front window to light the first candle on the Hanukkah menorah. Even my grandfather decided to pay attention to the ceremony from the comfort of his sofa seat. Jacob's father was the one who did the honors, but the moment he lit the candle for the center branch, the flame on the wick turned from vibrant orange to azure blue. That doesn't look right. Who cares? It's pretty. In the end, we chalked it up to something wrong with the cheap candlesticks they bought and didn't think much of it. Besides, the menorah was just one part in celebrating Hanukkah. We spent the rest of the night watching TV, playing dreidel, and stuffing our faces with oily latkes potato pancakes. At the end of the night, the family and I exchanged some small gifts before reciting some prayers. I couldn't understand a lick of the prayers since they were all in Hebrew, but I was just glad to be part of the festivities. My grandfather didn't have much energy to do much but eat from the comfort of his chair, but I like to think he had some fun too. The next few days went by in much the same way each night. My grandfather got more and more comfortable with Jacob's family during each day. However, the nights were a different matter. Each night, we would gather to add another candlestick to the Hanukkah menorah, which would always burn blue. And later, as we slept, I would hear my grandfather mutter in his sleep in the large guest room we shared. A lot of it 
was in German, which I couldn't understand. The only bit of English that I could catch from his nightly ramblings was something about a destroying angel. It all came to a head on the sixth night, when he woke up screaming in the middle of the night. Jacob and Noah rushed over from the bedroom beside ours, and I tried to calm him down as well. Everything's all right, sir. You're safe here. Yeah, it's okay to be scared of the dark. I used to be afraid too. Do you want to use my nightlight? My grandfather chuckled at Noah's offer. The thought of sleeping with a nightlight must have been so funny to him that he couldn't help but laugh. I'm all right, boy. I just had a nightmare is all. You get a lot of those when you're as old and miserable as I am. I'll be all right in the morning. The following morning, Noah brought out an old shoebox from his room and handed it to my grandfather. What is this? It's your Hanukkah present. Most of us didn't think you'd showed up, so none of us really prepared anything for you. No need to call us out like that. So I decided to give you something of mine for Hanukkah. My grandfather opened the old shoebox. Inside was a little teddy bear with scruffy brown hair and black button eyes. What is this? That's my golem, my old teddy bear. He used to protect me from all the monsters in my nightmares when I was little. Now he can protect you from yours. For a moment, my grandfather just stared at the teddy bear in silent disbelief. Then tears filled his eyes as he hugged both Noah and his gift equally tight in his arms while struggling to mutter his thanks in between sobs. On the eighth night of Hanukkah, the last night, the family gathered once more to light the last candle on the menorah. The moment the last candle was lit, everything in the room went silent. The fireplace burned without crackling and the wind outside howled without making a sound. Before anyone could say anything to break the silence, the lights in the house flickered. When they came back on, a hooded figure was standing in the middle of the living room. It was unnaturally tall and wore a black hooded robe that obscured its face in shadow. Its hands, the only visible part of its flesh, was chalk white and slender, like that of a woman's. Surprised, Jacob's father rushed to confront the figure. The moment he got close, the figure touched him on the forehead and he immediately slumped on the floor. His wife screamed and ran to him with Noah beside her. The figure placed its hands on their foreheads as well, and they fell onto the floor as well, unconscious but still breathing. Jacob rushed to the kitchen and came back to the living room, holding a knife. Mary, take your grandpa upstairs. But, Mary, now! Despite my worry, I grabbed my grandfather and helped him up the stairs and into the guest bedroom. I locked the door and grabbed the nearest weapon, a baseball bat. I waited in that bedroom with my grandfather for what felt like an eternity, waiting for the figure downstairs to make its presence known. When it did, the figure didn't knock or bang on the door. Instead, it simply walked right through the solid door as if it weren't there. I tightened my grip on the baseball bat and was about to rush at it when my grandfather laid a hand on my shoulder to stop me. It's all right, Mary. Grandpa, everything will be all right. Just, just let me talk to them. Before I could stop him, my grandfather walked right up to the figure and stared straight into the shadow of its hood. Are you here to kill me? I'm not sure if I was seeing things or not, but I could have sworn I saw the thing nod slightly in response. My grandfather merely let out a sigh. <sighs> Thank God, but please, can I talk to my granddaughter one last time before I go? The hooded figure did not answer, but since he was still alive, my grandfather must have taken it as a yes. He turned to me and took a deep breath. Mary, I need you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. This will be the last time we speak. Grandpa, what are you? Please, Mary, just listen. It's all right. <sighs> I've lived for far longer than I deserved anyways. But before I go, I need you to know why it has to be this way. A long time ago, when I was a young man, I was a soldier in the Nazi army. I hated Jews then. I thought they were the reason why Germany fell from grace. I've killed them thinking they were monsters and escaped to America after the war ended not to be tried for my crimes. It looks like 
They've finally caught up to me, though. Grandpa! It's fine, Mary. This is what I want. And it's more than I deserve. I got to meet your wonderful boyfriend and his lovely family. These past eight days have been the happiest days in my long, sad, hateful life. Now I see that the Jews were never the monsters. I was. And monsters need to be killed so good people can live without fear. Those were the last words my grandfather ever spoke to me. When he was finished, the destroying angel placed a hand on his head and his body immediately went limp. But before he could hit the ground, the angel caught his lifeless body and gently placed him on the bed. And with that, the angel was gone, vanished right before my eyes, leaving me alone in the room with my grandfather dead on the bed and my boyfriend's family asleep downstairs. It's been years since that day. I'm getting married to Jacob in a traditional Jewish wedding. Nobody but me remembers being visited by the destroying angel that Hanukkah. When everyone woke up later that night, they had no memory of the hooded figure that appeared and assumed that they passed out from exhaustion. The paramedic who came to take my grandfather's body determined the cause of death to be of old age. I don't know where my grandfather is now. I can only hope that my grandfather found enough redemption in those eight days of Hanukkah for God to forgive him.